We are doing a tier list video today of every single game I've played in 2024. Let's go. Unfortunately, too many games, too little time to actually play them all. Let's address the ones I was somewhat interested in, but couldn't quite get around to playing first. So first up, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Believe it or not, I've just recently become a fan of uh, Final Fantasy VII. Uh, I played the remake four years ago and it wasn't really up my alley, uh, but then I played the original PS1 game last year and I freaking loved it. Uh, I now understand why Final Fantasy VII is such a big deal. The remake didn't impress me in the slightest though, so I wasn't too psyched to start uh, Rebirth as soon as possible. Judging from the reception though, I think this game has the potential to possibly win uh, game of the year, or the uh, best RPG of the year at the very least. Black Myth Wukong. I cannot believe what a big deal this game ended up being. I didn't know it had this much hype built around it. Uh, I was downplaying the shit out of it before it came out. There's also this Wukong game coming in October that I have on my wish list for some reason. Then it released and sold 16 million copies in just 10 days and then proceeded to slap me in my dumb stupid face. If I was placing bats, uh, logically speaking, I'd say Black Myth Wukong is most likely going to win the end of the year. That's my prediction. It's, it's either this or Astrobot. Dragon's Dogma 2. I know literally nothing about this game, but I thought it looked pretty fun, so I might get around to playing it one day. Silent Hill 2. Uh, same thing. I know nothing about it, but I do know it's a big deal. Resident Evil 4 Remake uh, was my game of the year last year, though, and it really changed my opinion on horror games for the better. So maybe I'll give this one a shot one day too, if it's anything like RE4. Zenless Zone Zero. I played a little bit of this one, but I stopped because I only have room for one never-ending life service gacha game in my life, and Honkai Star Rail already fills that role beautifully. Unicorn Overlord. This is one I was very interested with. Uh, I like VanillaWare's games. But just with, with the sheer amount of high quality games released this year uh, and no time to play them all, we all had to sacrifice one or two games. And unfortunately for me, that was Unicorn Overlord this year. I'll get around to it sometime soon. Starle Blade. Uh, I played the demo for this one and thought it was beautiful. It's literally just near Automata, but with actual uh, fun gameplay. It's probably the game I'm buying next after I'm done with the games I have now. Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. Uh, I also played the demo for this one, but it did not impress me enough, honestly. Uh, after waiting 10 whole ass years, I'd have only been satisfied if it straight up gave me a glimpse into heaven itself, which it unfortunately did not do. Hades 2. Once it's on PS5, then I'll play this one. Okay, uh, the rest I've played, and now I'll go in the order I played them. Okay, so uh, first up is Persona 3 Reload. Just, just fucking put it up there. <laughs> uh, this was my most anticipated game of, forget 2024. This is the most anticipated game of my freaking life. Persona 3 is my favorite game of all time, and seeing it remade like this is a dream come true. I, I'm still in disbelief it actually happened. But uh, here's the thing, uh, as much as I love this game, I don't think it's my game of the year. Why is that you ask? Well, it's because I already played and finished all other versions of Persona 3 multiple times across my life. And truthfully, Reload didn't add nearly enough new stuff for me to consider it an entirely new experience. If anything, I still prefer FES, the PS2 version, over Reload. The entire gameplay flow was thrown out of whack in Reload, uh, the game's balancing out the window. And that goes for both combat and the time management aspect. Reload feels less like a remake of Persona 3 and more like Persona 5 wearing the dead mangled corpse of Persona 3. Besides the shiny new graphics of course, everything's pretty much a downgrade. The, the gameplay, the music, the, uh, the, the fucking voice acting, it's, some are better, some are worse. So think about it, am I really going to give the title of game of the year to a downgrade? No. Of course I'm not. But it's still Persona 3 at the end of the day. Same lovable characters, same heartbreaking story, uh, same gameplay loop, mostly. So I'd say it still deserves to be up here. Although realistically speaking, I think for most people it should be an A tier game. But I just can't bring myself to put it down there. Next up is Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth. This game should have been way better than it actually ended up being. 
uh, its prequel Yakuza 7 is one of the best JRPGs in the market, and I was ready for Infinite 12 to exceed it in every way possible, but it just face planted so hard. The biggest problem I feel that modern Yakuza games face is just how bloated they are with useless side content. Literally cut this game's content by like half, and we've got a much better game overall. You gotta trim the fat, cause there is a masterpiece hidden in here somewhere. You can't get anywhere in this game without the flow being ground to a complete halt as they have you play another dumb minigame with its own extensive side story. It's exhausting as hell. The new characters this game introduces were so good, so why didn't they focus the story more around them? And as much as I love Kiryu, why is he back? Why are all these characters back for that matter? There's a lot of stuff in here that should have been left on the cutting room floor. Despite all the pointless distractions though, uh, once you get to the meat of the combat and the story, there's a ton of fun to be had here. So many job classes to experiment with, uh, so many wacky enemies to fight, uh, mysteries to uncover. So overall, I put Infinite 12 in the A tier. This upcoming part Yakuza game better be a double S tier game I swear to god Tekken 8 uh, I'm telling you right now I suck at fighting games so I'm mostly judging Tekken 8 based on the single player content which modern fighting games tend to gloss over in favor of online play. I bought this game specifically because I saw people online going so crazy with the character customization feature that I thought it would be bordering on soul caliber levels of impressive. But once I actually got in there, I saw how limited the options were. After being disappointed with both the single player content and the character customization feature, I said screw it, I'll play the game the way they want me to play it, and went to online mode. Now my main's always been Huarang, but uh, I wanted to switch things up this time around and went with Oscar. I had fun climbing the ranks, not gonna lie, but that is until I got to rank Vanquisher and I got stuck there forever. People online just constantly kept beating my ass to oblivion. I'd be lying if I said it was an enjoyable experience. I win one match, feel like I'm on top of the world, and then lose the next 10 matches and get demoted to the previous rank, which just feels so demeaning. I have never before gotten this mad playing a fighting game before in my life. It's something about Tekken specifically just feels cheap. I, I myself don't know why, but Tekken 8 is going in the C tier for me. Next is Animal World. I freaking love this game. Uh, the only metroidvania that ever actually kept me interested enough to actually finish. So many creative puzzles to solve, uh, so many secrets to uncover, it's insane how many secrets there are in this game. And there's zero hand-holding, there isn't even dialogue in this game. The game just says go, explore this freakishly hellish well, and just be mindful you don't shit yourself along the way. If you're a big fan of metroidvanias, uh, Animal Well would be an easy A or S tier for you. As for me though, as good as a game like this gets, I don't see myself putting it anywhere above a B tier. Rise of the Ronin. What have they done to you, my sweet child? They just had to go open world with this one, didn't they? You know, appease the majority, even though they don't know the first thing on how to make an open world game in the first place. Keep in mind, I played both Elden Ring and Red Dead 2 for the first time this year. So playing this game right next to those just puts into to perspective just how ass this game's open world is. Never attempt to do this shit again, Team Ninja. I swear to God. Please just stick to what you do best. High intensity action games, that's what you do best. And thankfully there is a fraction of that still in here, so uh, I can at least give it some credit and place it in the B tier. And now, Shin Megami Tensei 5 Vengeance. My beloved immediate S tier, one of the best gaming experiences I've had for a while now. Gameplay wise, I've never had this much fun playing a game before in my life. So many demons to recruit, so many possible team compositions, the best turn-based battle system to date, challenging encounters in every corner, and with over 40 awesome battle themes to accompany every single one of those encounters, Vengeance is just pure fun incarnate, especially when you get to endgame. The negatives, of course, include the very lackluster story for whichever story path you end up choosing, and the fact that you can't exactly experience everything this game has to offer in a single playthrough because of the two paths being split between the, uh, the canon of creation, which is the original SMT5 story, and the canon of vengeance where all the new content takes place. I really wish they would have combined the contents of both of these paths into one singular large game. 
because as it stands, you end up missing out on whole areas, bosses, and even context or story bits if you decide to jump straight into the new content. As crappy as the story for the original SMT5 was, there were some heavy hitting cutscenes here and there. So seeing new players miss out on all that kind of sucks. Now I placed it above Reload because Vengeance is just a straight up upgrade from the original SMT5 and actually feels like a whole brand new experience, which I can't say the same thing about Reload unfortunately. So I wouldn't feel weird in the slightest potentially calling SMT5 my game of the year. Now Elden Ring Shadow of the Earth for you. There, now there's no denying that Elden Ring is an S tier game. Uh, saying anything otherwise would be very misguided. But we're not ranking Elden Ring today. We're only judging the quality of the DLC. And honestly, it didn't blow me away. It, it was just okay. It's a bit more of the same, but just with even more horrible balancing, as if the base game didn't suffer from that already. The bosses in the DLC are, are very hit or miss. Uh, I really like uh, Rilana's fight, uh, probably my favorite fight in the entirety of Elden Ring. But then you got ones like uh, Commander Gaius, where you have to bend the reality of time and space every time you want to dodge one of his never-ending charges. Then we got ones like uh, the Dancing Lion and Bale, where I literally have zero clue what's going on half the time just because they're just so chaotic. And then you got Radon, who can suck the fattest ass on the face of the earth, and I hope he suffocates on that shit. What in God's name were they thinking when they made this boss? Besides the bosses, uh, World Exploration, the other main selling point of the Soul series, was also a bit underwhelming here. The new maps weren't bad per se, they weren't great either, they're just very meh. But overall, it's still the same addicting gameplay loop we all know and love, so I had a great time and I'm glad that this DLC exists. So I'd place Shadow of the Earth 3 in the A tier. Next up is volumes 3 and 4 of Honkai Star Rail, so the Pentacony arc. The Pentacony arc is by far the best arc in the game. If I had to rank them, I'd go Pentacony, uh, Yarido 6, and then the Chinese place, I forgot the name. As always, Honkai Star Rail's strength is in its combat. Uh, now, an outsider looking in might say it's fairly straightforward. After all, every single character's only got like three possible actions. But its depth is found in all the possible team compositions you can have, plus the enemy variety. The monsters you encounter in Pentacony are some of the are very creative. Some of the most creative enemies I've ever seen in an RPG. I especially love these TV monsters where they change personalities and properties every time you hit them. You're essentially changing the channel, so to speak. So many new characters introduced this year. Uh, my favorite was definitely Robin. Uh, she still occupies like 20% of my brain at all times, especially because I never actually managed to get her in my party. And I'll be damned if I ever pay actual money on this game. The day that happens is the day hell itself freezes over. But here's the thing as always. Now, the Pentacony arc has a problem. It's a problem that persists throughout Honkai Star Rail, but Pentacony takes that problem and multiplies it by a hundred gajillion. Man, characters in this game talk so much and they spout so much gibberish. I addressed this in my uh, JRPG fans' uh, thoughts on Honkai Star Rail video, but without a Wikipedia page opened up at all times, this game's story is just impossible to follow. And you can't skip the cutscenes either, so I end up pulling my phone out and just browsing Reddit waiting for them to finish talking. And Pentacony in particular just puts you to sleep. It goes on for too damn long and the gameplay loop walking around doing the same puzzles and fighting the same enemies doesn't change all throughout the arc. So by the midway point, I just wanted it to be over. If anything, as fun as this game is, it's not one I'd want to play day in and day out, as much as the gacha mechanics want that to be the case. I'm gonna have to put it in the low A tier. Now Astrobot, uh, the other possible uh, contender, I think, for game of the year. Astrobots really changed my perspective on platformers for the better. I'd give it a solid A tier. Now, I know I called SMT5 pure fun incarnate, but that's more for RPG fans. Astrobot now, that now that's just pure fun for anybody and everybody. I genuinely can't see how someone could possibly not like Astrobot. Uh, come the fuck on. How can you not at least like this game? when it's this wholesome. If you dislike this game, you're probably the kind of person who's just like a clump of malice, who brings nothing but misery to anybody you interact with. 
Okay, maybe that's a bit much. The game's good points. The music is enchanting. What's other AAA games to shame with the soundtrack? Controls are smooth, simple, and makes full use of the DualSense controller. Before AstroBot, I used to make fun of this thing. Not anymore though, I, I get it now. Everything AstroBot is subject to, you can also feel through your hands as well. I I'm not even joking. It's this uh, clockwork gear part that got me the most. I could feel every crank moving in the palm of my hands. More games should make use of this technology. So, seriously, it's a game changer. I also loved seeing uh, some of my favorite games of all time represented somewhere in this game. Uh, the moment I saw that we can find freaking Dark Cloud and Rogue Galaxy in here somewhere, two games I thought long forgotten by Sony was the moment I decided I had to get this game for myself. It showed me just how much they truly care no matter how big or small the franchise is. Now I'd be happy for Astrobot if it won game of the year, but is it my game of the year? No, of course not. That, that, that'd just be silly. As good as a platformer gets, it's still just a platformer at the end of the day. No offense. Next is... oh... Dear God, help me. I wanted to forget this game ever existed. What a huge steaming pile of shit this game was. It's a visual novel with some of the worst, most frustrating dialogue known to man. I don't know how you make a game about detectives with superpowers suck, but that's what they did. This, this, this game fucking sucks. Every single case in this game always has some kind of convenient bullshit happen just to make it work. Uh, it's riddled with plot holes. Our protagonists make baseless assumptions at every turn just to move the story forward. And every single character is annoying and dumb as hell. Which is ironic, because they're supposed to be detectives. The final chapter was really good, I'll admit, and makes up for the first five chapters of pure torture I've been exposed to. But not enough to put it any higher than a C tier. I can't believe I spent a year hoping for this game to be ported to PlayStation. Now, this shit should have stayed on the Switch. Here's hoping the team redeems themselves with the 100 Line Defense Academy game thing. And now, going from that sorry excuse for a game to possibly one of the best games ever made, we got Metaphor Re Fantasio. I cannot believe how good this game is. Yeah, well, well uh, I can believe it. It's the big three at Atlas who made this masterpiece after all, but I didn't expect it to be this good. I can't think of a single negative thing you can say about Metaphor. Gameplay is damn near perfect, and not as complex as SD 5s combat, but better than Personas and still pretty darn fun. So many classes to choose from, uh, and so much room for experimentation, it's insane. Uh, I love the entire cast of characters, especially the guys, uh, man, Stroll, Heisme, and Basilio, I couldn't ask for better party members. I even love Luis as an antagonist. Now, truthfully, I did get sick of him towards the end, uh, but goddamn, does this guy have a daunting presence to him. And the story, my god. Uh, I, I can't remember the last time I was this invested in a JRPG storyline. I will say that the last few story bits felt a bit too generic for my liking. Uh, now, speaking in Persona 5 terms, uh, I'd say the finale is more akin to the Holy Grail levels of hype and not the superior third semester alternate reality levels of hype. If you haven't played Persona 5, you have no idea what the fuck I'm saying. Also, one more thing, uh, by the end, it gets comical how convenient the phrase Oh, it's the Magnus doing gets to explain the unexplainable, basically. Uh, oh, what, you're hearing voices in your head? Nah, d don't worry, that's just the Magla fucking with you. Oh, what, you're hallucinating? Nah, d don't worry, that's the Magla's doing, that's Magla probably. Oh, what's that? How were the pyramids built, you ask? <laughs> Why, well, that was the Magna, of course. But even then, that's just a personal nitpick. I wouldn't say the final acts were flaws, per se. But yeah, uh, overall, just a masterpiece of the game. Uh, it's, of course, going in the S tier. But I honestly don't know if I prefer it over SMT5. Uh, this is a tough one. Uh, I'm going to place it behind SMT5 for now, because I just remember uh, having more fun with s 5s gameplay personally, even though I'd say Metaphor is an all-around uh, much higher quality experience. And finally, we got East 10 Nordics, which I'm actually still playing right now, but I wanted to get this video out sooner. So keep in mind, this is basically just a first impression. I'm judging the game based on the first 10 hours, and honestly, it's not looking too good. Frankly, it's mostly because of the sheer amount of cutscenes they overwhelm you with. East games are supposed to be intense, fast-paced action games. The action and exploration are its main selling points. 
Their stories are laughably bad, so why would they give it most of the spotlight here in East End? It makes no sense. The E series unfortunately suffers from being a franchise that's gone on for so long that its modern entries are tied down by lore created in the freaking 80s. They have to play by the rules of this ancient series' lore, and that forbids them from going crazy with these modern plot lines. I honestly wouldn't mind it that much if the E-Series suddenly decided to be a story-based game, but at least make it a story that's worth telling. But no, there are zero new ideas here, so far at least. Uh, they even pulled the buff guy, slim guy, uh, sexy lady villain combo again, which they pull in every single game they ever make. Gameplay-wise, I'm really divided on it. Uh, at first, it felt much better than E's 8 and 9 but then you realize that they removed core mechanics like the flash move and flash guard. What's more, you only get two characters to control this time. I genuinely don't understand how the East games keep on getting worse after East 8. Now, I dunk on East 9 a lot too, but even it had some things going for it. Exploring Balduk, uh, finding secrets along the way, uh, it was really fun. So how do you go from that to this? Also, no unique weapon skins? Really? You buy a new weapon and it just looks the same as the old weapon you've always had? Really? What the fuck happened? The E series is evolving. Uh, just backwards. I'm really starting to wish I just played East 8 again. The only thing I actually like about East 10 so far is the relationship between Adol and Karja. Uh, I like that they went for a more brother sister dynamic rather than. Uh, a pseudo romantic one like they always do. It's going in the C tier for now, but again, I'm only 10 hours in. Who knows how I'll feel about it in the near future. But uh, honestly, I don't see it going anywhere above a B tier. And that is all the games I played in 2024, with Atlas games dominating the S tier. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Atlas, I, I don't know how the fuck they do it. Uh, I know it sounds stupid, but when a company puts out quality products like these every single time, I swear it feels like they're doing it with barely any monetary gain in mind. It's really impressive. It isn't the case, but it feels that way. They just really love what they do, and they put so much heart and soul into these games. Honestly though, I'm still not sure which of these three is my game of the year. Depending on my mood, on different days, I might give you a different answer. I don't know, I might make a follow-up video uh, analyzing these games and logically deciding which of these, uh, which of them is best. Uh, but for now, fuck it, it's my list, and I say all three of them are my game of the year. Okay, so here are my predictions for uh, the actual game of the year nominees. I think the three that will definitely be there are Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, uh, Astrobot and Black Myth Wukong, which I think will win. By some miracle, we might also get Metaphor be nominated, uh, considering the reception and the Metacritic reviews. But let's be real, even if it was, it's not going to be winning anytime soon. Uh, that will only happen in a perfect world where everybody's played every single game and nobody's biased. So, yeah, that's all from me. See ya.